Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Europe. How does the continent deal with a rising China and a US president who riles his own allies? We'll look at the threats facing Europe from a silent Chinese economic takeover to a full-blown trade war with the United States. Also, as Black Lives Matter draws the world's attention, we'll look at how Silicon Valley and the world of finance has really failed black people. And we'll talk to the CEO who funds black businesses. And state-backed cyber attacks, they're nothing new, but they're also on the rise during the pandemic. And the targets are the vaccine makers and laboratories. These are, I think we can all agree, extraordinary times. But zoom out and you'll see the big picture is just as unpredictable. We're focusing on Europe this week, which is at a bit of a crossroads when you consider the pandemic, as well as an expansive China and a retreating United States. As we know, President Trump has a habit of undermining his allies. He surprised a lot of people by saying he plans to withdraw 9,500 troops from Germany. And a decision to expand sanctions on a gas pipeline from Russia to Germany has been met with anger in Berlin. But it is the rising threat from the East looming large, not only China's human rights record, its aggression towards its neighbours, but fears that it could actually use the pandemic to establish its economic supremacy across Europe. We'll talk it all through in a moment with our guest. First, Dominic Kane sets the scene from Berlin. In ports across Europe, vast vessels arrive from China on a regular basis, offloading goods destined for the EU and the UK, and then returning with goods for the Chinese market. But it's a relationship that people in Brussels feel is not equal. We continue to have an unbalanced trade and investment relationship. We have not made the progress we aimed for in the last year's summit statement in addressing market access barriers. We need to follow up on these commitments urgently. And we also need to have more ambition on the Chinese side in order to conclude negotiations on an investment agreement. This thought runs counter to the stated aim of the Chinese Premier, Li Keqiang. At an event late last month, he seemed to indicate his country's commitment to equality in trade. We will enhance the cooperation with the rest of the world and will launch more measures to expand opening up our own initiative. Opening is just like the air. One cannot live without it for a minute. While opening to the world, we will also work on maintaining the stability of the global industry and supply chains. Many governments in Europe and across the Atlantic see a stark contrast between Premier Li's words and his government's actions. The U.S. Secretary of State pulls no punches. The Chinese Communist Party strong arms nations to do business with Huawei, an arm of the CCP's surveillance state. And it's flagrantly attacking European sovereignty by buying up ports and critical infrastructure. Greece to Valencia, we must take off the golden blinders of economic ties see that the China challenge isn't just at the gates, it's in every capital, it's in every borough, it's in every province. Every investment from a Chinese state-owned enterprise should be viewed with suspicion. Ministers here have shown a marked reluctance to speak out so forcefully. Germany exported around $400 billion worth of goods to China in the last four years, meaning many German firms have strong links with the Chinese markets, links they cannot afford to lose. One analyst says this puts the Europeans in a difficult position. So this is maybe the one reason why the Europeans and the Germans are so hesitant in, in using the strong weapon of, of sanctions against China because we want something from China. We want to have that trade deal, but we don't want to have a bad deal. What complicates matters is the perception in many Western capitals of how the Chinese government treats its own people. Scenes like these in Hong Kong this year have drawn strong condemnation from the EU and US. The British government has denounced changing Chinese policy vis-à-vis -vis Hong Kong. We are deeply troubled uh, about this step and we've put out a joint statement. And the decision now lies with uh, China, but if it follows through on this legislation and implements it, it would clearly violate the autonomy of the people of Hong Kong and it would also violate the freedom set out in the UK-China uh, joint declaration which dates back to 1984. 
The Chinese government bristles at such suggestions. There's no single word or clause in the Sino-British Joint Declaration that enforces the UK carrier's responsibility for Hong Kong after its return. The UK has no sovereignty, jurisdiction or supervision over Hong Kong after its return. Therefore, the UK has no right to make responsible remarks on Hong Kong affairs and interfere in China's internal affairs. For the Federal Republic of Germany, this poses an ethical problem. Its basic law is enshrined in liberalism, democracy and humanitarianism. I advocate an open dialogue in which we continue to work with China on such important issues as the conclusion of an investment agreement, progress in climate protection and our common role in Africa, but also on issues of the rule of law and human rights. One Berlin-based analyst says that chimes with the view increasingly held in German society. In terms of public opinion, we do see that people are starting to become more critical. We have regularly asked what Germans think about China's increasing role on the international stage. Very few people actually, only 11% last year said that that was a positive development. And yet it's clear that in Beijing the desire is to deepen its investment in and involvement with Europe in the near future, leaving the Europeans with a dilemma. Concentrate on economics and downplay humanitarianism or find new economic solutions to allow them to retain the moral high ground. And into that question comes what some analysts believe is a vacuum of US influence under the current president regarding global issues like climate change. The United States under President Trump are not a partner in this project any longer. So we need China as the, global, the other global power uh, to cooperate with us on, on climate change. We also need China to remain the core of the multilateral world order. So again, the US under Trump actually is not a partner in that any longer. All of which means that in Brussels and Berlin, there are many long-term questions being asked. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, Berlin. With us now from London, Robert Courtley Gignero. He is a visiting fellow at the Hellenic Observatory at the London School of Economics. Nice to have you with us. So we've got this split. Uh, Berlin slash Angela Merkel uh, wants to keep those ties with China. And then you've got the other sort of part of Europe, you could say the Brussels slash Macron side, uh, which is more wary of that. Um, can, can they exist side by side? Kamal, good morning. Thank you for having me. I think it's an interesting time. Obviously, Chancellor Merkel takes over the EU Council presidency for the last time next week. And she has said she will use the time uh, to have constructive dialogue with China, which really, sadly, really doesn't really mean anything. Um, I think it's important to look at it from an economic level, which is that Ch China ultimately has a much stronger trading relationship with Germany uh, than it does with France. In this particular instance, uh, Germany is the fifth largest trading partner with China, whereas uh, France is the 17th or 18th largest trading partner. I think when it comes to human rights uh, and even some actions of investment in emerging markets, the EU position with China is, is unsustainable. Um, going forward. It's not going to work. European Union also rolling out some protections for its industries and, and, and Germany would know about that, wouldn't it? They've, they've had uh, their uh, aerospace industry and, and technology industries uh, impacted already. Yeah, there's an understandable level of concern around China's investment into, into Europe. Uh, but I think it's also important to remember and look both sides and think, well, actually at times the Chinese have been willing to invest where Others haven't. And so between 2008 and 2018, mm. uh, China invested 320 billion into the EU when there was no investment. And it's helped regions to improve and it's helped companies to improve. And we forget that uh, Chinese investment owns, Chinese investors mm. own uh, Volvo, they own a significant proportion of Daimler, they own Piraeus Port, and those have been good investments. But the problem at the bottom line is, and this is something that obviously Marguerite Investigator is worried about, and many EUs are worried about, is that there is no separation between the Chinese state and Chinese business, mm. which, again, is not really compatible with the way the EU works. I wonder, though, if Angela Merkel is actually being almost prudent in her thinking uh, with China, given the other major relation Europe has with the United States is declining, shall we say. With regards to the United States, the US is pressuring uh, and pressurising 
Germany to uh, resolve issues like Nord Stream 2. Germany gets 70% of its gas uh, from Russia. It doesn't seem compatible for the US to be spending an awful lot of money uh, protecting and guarding Germany from an invasion from Russia, which is not going to happen. Mm. Um, and it costs a lot of money to have troops in Germany. So there is a troop, there, there is a discussion around having troops going to Poland and Ukraine instead because they're being redeployed, which would be much cheaper for the US. We can focus too much on, on, on Germany, can't we, just because of its power. Just finally and briefly, uh, how would you describe the state of, of trade and economic relations between, between the US and Europe right now? It can get, well, I wonder if the nuances can get uh, covered up by Donald Trump and the things he says about Europe's terrible, it treats America terribly, Germany doesn't pay its dues to NATO, all these sorts of things. Clearly, relations with the US and the EU are, are strained with the trade, and, and the lots of the tech stocks are front and centre of that. I think what you've seen, or what you are seeing, as part of a post-COVID-19 movement, is a global economic realignment, or deglobalization, which is, for some people, what it is. And what you have instead, I think, is the EU prioritising its future, uh, the case it has to make for strengthening its own market, its internal market. Mm. It's about the access that companies get. It's about the access that you get to customers. And that, that is the problem. The problem is not necessarily that the relations are strained, but where the relations are going further on. Right. Robert Quartley, Genera, talking, well, Europe, the US and China with us this week. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, the death of George Floyd at the hands of a white police officer in the United States has opened up a lot of conversations about black representation in almost every sphere. This is not a movement just about violence against black people. It is about, quote-unquote, the system. This number should shock you, 0.4%. According to Harvard University, that is the proportion of black people who got money from venture funds between 1990 and 2016. Less than half a percent in the period where money was really being freed up because of the emergence of dot-com. But disparities like this go back to the birth of the nation, really. Equal opportunity has always been denied to the black community. For example, the net worth of an average white family, it's $171,000. For a black family, it is roughly a tenth of that, $17,000, which means when black people try to start a business, they don't have access to that existing family wealth. But it's also estimated that the spending power of people of colour in the United States is about a trillion dollars. And so some are now trying to redress the balance and properly recognise the lack of diversity in the tech and financial sector. One particular venture capital group, Impact X Capital, has invested in 17 startups and is raising $100 million for a new fund. Eric Collins is the CEO of Impact X Capital. He's with us from London now, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. I, I know that you are all about other people and finding their stories. Was it difficult, though? I mean, the, the crux of what we're talking about is the idea of money not making it into the hands of people of colour. Is that, was that your experience? So my experience is, I think, shared by a number of other entrepreneurs. What I found before becoming a venture capitalist is what was reported in the Kaufman Fellows research recently, that between 2001 and 2018, that we have an actual, that we find that black and diverse entrepreneurs actually have a much harder time raising capital in the first place. But once they've actually raised capital, there's an interesting dichotomy. What then happens is they actually are able to raise more capital than their non diverse counterparts. And in addition, they return more capital to um, investors, 30% more capital after um, they actually exit. So the interesting thing is, I think that there is this, there is truth that there is challenge in terms of raising capital, but then there's this mythology that, that black entrepreneurs and diverse entrepreneurial teams don't return at the same, if not a greater rate. And the facts show us studying 260,000 founders, mm. studying 20,000 startup companies, that in fact, diverse entrepreneurs and diverse teams actually deliver more uh, and are able to raise more. So what, is it, what is it behind, you say the facts, the facts say that, what is behind those facts? What is it that means that, those returns are as good as you say. I think behind the facts, uh, Kamal, is a very interesting sort of complicity. And I've said this before. This, if you look at venture capital, venture capital is very, very interesting at the moment among most people. 
the idea that you can create um, in a single generation huge amounts of wealth. Uh, think of Jeff Bezos mm. and sort of the richest person in the world right now. That is created through technology. And that technology um, business that he built called Amazon started off with venture backing because banks wouldn't actually fund his ideas. They couldn't see the future. He was able to raise money through venture capital. What we find, though, is that there are generally funds that are not coming from diverse investors that are going to those um, organizations, and that indeed the, the venture capital industry itself shows itself to be one that likes pattern recognition. So if there are white men who are making decisions, they make decisions that lead to an Amazon, more white men are backed in order to make decisions to back more white men to lead to more companies that are like Amazon and others, because that is a belief. And what we don't find is that there's either pressure at the top of the organization within themselves to say we should do anything differently. Mm -hmm. It feels as though what we're doing is right. We are the West Coast. We are Silicon Valley. Everyone else in the world envies us. Why should we change and incorporate women and people of color into our decision-making ranks? Why should we invest in black and diverse entrepreneurs and women-led um, companies? Because we have found that if we back Microsoft, if we back um, Amazon, if we back Google, if we back Facebook, all of those are huge companies and all of them are run by white men, invested by white men. The challenge is if we don't break this and we don't have people like LPs, the uh, endowments and the pensions that are putting money behind these organizations, forcing these organizations to have a conversation about could they have had better results which the Kaufman research that I mentioned earlier actually refers to, we could get better results if we were using diversity, then we will never get a change in this. And that complicity, this sort of idea that what we're going to be doing is the same thing forever and ever, will continue to be one of the hampers to um, our ability, hampering factors to our ability to actually grow really great businesses. You used an interesting word there. You said forcing, forcing these companies and people to take a look at themselves and, and question what they, more they could be doing. Um, that's not great. I mean, it's, I just think of it on, on a, a human level, it's not great that people should be forced to think about that because these should have been things which have been thought about anyway. In fact, arguably, they shouldn't be thought about at all in an ideal world. <laughs> I know we don't live in that, but really, none of this should be a, should be a, a, a hurdle. What is it? Is it, is it structural? Is it, is it uh, unconscious bias? What is it that's, that's forced us to do well, it? You make, some, you make a very interesting point, and you and I are in violent agreement about this. This should not be something that needs to be thought about. But when I was in Boston and I received my first term sheet back uh, 20, 25 years ago, there were less than 1% of venture capital investing went to black entrepreneurs. Less than 4% went to women-led teams. It is now 2020, Kamal, and the same numbers exist in Europe, in the United States that less than 1% of venture capital funding goes to black entrepreneurs and less than 4% goes to women-led teams. That is a number which hasn't changed over 20 years. I love the quite, I love the opportunity for incentives. When I build a business, I try and incentivize founders to stick around, key employees to actually contribute in ways that seem almost superhuman. Mm. But when we come to the situation of venture capital being invested, it appears that incentives, whether they be government-backed or others, have not led to the result of a more diverse set of decision makers and then allocation of capital. So I'm getting farther and farther away from my perception that there are incentives that can actually exist and that there needs to somehow be more of a forcing function. Mm. And that forcing function, whether it be quotas or others, needs to be taken into account. And here in the UK, where I exist, I sit here in London, there actually has been um, forcing function that's been taken uh, that's been taken into account with respect to women on boards of directors and in right. other positions of management. So we do see that those exist, and if we go all the way back to the 1960s and 70s in the United States, um, we had affirmative action, we had things that went along with the Civil Rights Bill, to, in order to make sure that the systemic issues, we might not be able to change people's hearts and minds, hmm. we need to change their pocketbooks, which maybe will drive some different solutions and different sort of perceptions of the future, Just or what their, their actions that are being taken. But quite frankly, if we can't get to the point of um, getting their hearts and minds to change through incentives, then we need to make, because we can't continue down this road mm. for another 30 years. No, exactly. One of the reasons why no, just, it doesn't exist this at all. Eric Collins from Impact X Capital. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal.
a sophisticated state-based cyber actor. That is how Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison described the player behind months of computer hacking attempts on government institutions. He would go no further than that, leaving it to the public and the media to decide just who he was talking about, but the prevailing theory is that it has at least something to do with China, though China denies any responsibility. The pandemic has seen an increase in cyber attacks right around the world, and perhaps oddly, many have been targeted at the very research labs developing the vaccines or drugs to combat the virus. Researchers and drugs makers don't necessarily expect to make huge sums of money from the deployment of their products, but it will enable economies to open fully, and that helps everyone. Not to mention there'd be plenty of kudos and the possibility of the vaccine being gifted around the world. So who would attack these labs and institutions? We're going to talk to Robert Hannigan about that. He's the chairman of the cybersecurity firm Blue Voyant International, also previously the director of the UK's largest intelligence and security agency, GCHQ. So well-placed to talk to us about these issues, Robert. You know, after any sort of attack, our, our immediate thought is, well, who would do this? But a cyber attack on the very people who are trying to stop this virus and this pandemic... I, all I can think is, just, yeah, who would do that? <laughs> well, it's it's a great question because at a time when everybody's suffering under this pandemic, you would think this would be the last target. But actually, during the, the, the COVID months, we've seen a big focus on the healthcare system. So attacks uh, against pharma companies, against health institutions, and a lot of fraud related to COVID. So it's not that surprising. And if you think the most valuable intellectual property in the world right now is a vaccine for COVID-19 or any effective treatment. Um, you can see why you know, criminals and nation states would be going after this, but particularly nation states. So let's talk about that, this idea of sort of state-on-state -state cyber attacks. Is that more, quote-unquote, effective, or is that the end game rather than going after individuals or companies? Well, this is at the high end. Most cyber attacks are criminal. They're about money. And most of what we all experience every day in our companies and uh, at home in cyber attacks are to do with crime. But at the high end of sophistication, nation states have been attacking each other for at least 15 years in cyberspace and very aggressively in the last few years. So there's a history to this. It's not suddenly started in the pandemic. The example that we've had recently from Australia, where the Australian Prime Minister talked about state-based or state-backed cyber terrorism, he's very careful not to say who he thinks it is. Um, but I think we can safely say the prevailing theory out there is that it's something to do with, uh, with China. And, and China just basically says, no, it wasn't us. Yep, but well, the Australian government, as you say, have been careful not to attribute this time. But on previous occasions when there was an attack on the Australian Parliament last year, attacks against the defence sector, they did attribute to China. And this attack looks quite similar uh, in its methodology, um, in its targeting of state institutions and organisations. Um, so there are obvious uh, questions about whether this is China again, given the tensions between China and Australia over mm -hmm. COVID most recently. When we talk about, and again, using the phrase, this was state-based actors. Now, an actor in this case could be the state or it could be uh, a company which we see in plain sight. Uh, the, the obvious examples when we talk in China are the likes of Huawei and TikTok, which people seem to have this fear about. Uh, I mean, do you feel those fears are, are warranted? Well, there is certainly a worry about uh, Chinese state-backed enterprises because in China there is no distinction really between the state and the Communist Party and the private sector. And while it's not fair to say that every Chinese company is simply an arm of the state, if the state asked them to do something for the state, they would have to do it. They would have to under the law, but also for their own self-preservation. So. We have to be wary, I think, about uh, companies that are based in China. Just finally, what sort of money... I mean, we're essentially talking about a business here. Cyber hacking, it is a business. How much money or what sort of sums of money are being poured into it on both sides, not just the attacking, but trying to fight back against it? Well, you're absolutely right that it's about money. And the best guesstimates, frankly, about cyber-related fraud run into the trillions of dollars over the next few years. Um, and it is mostly about cyber criminal groups. But nation states at the high end are doing this to pursue political objectives. For example, we've seen a really uh, 
uh, concentrated example in the Gulf recently with the uh, attack on Israeli water um, treatment facility by Iran, allegedly, and um, a counterattack by Israel against an Iranian port. Um, so uh, that's a nice example of how states are pursuing political agendas uh, and defending themselves in, in cyberspace uh, and attacking in cyberspace. Robert Hannigan talking cyber attacks with us this week. Thank you so much for your time. Do appreciate it. And that is where we'll leave things for this week. But I want to hear from you, your thoughts on this week's show or for future episodes at Kamal AJE. You can tweet or direct message me with the hashtag AJCTC. Uh, our inbox is open as well. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. And there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC as well. That takes you directly to our homepage. Individual reports, links and entire episodes for you to catch up on there. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.